I'm Alexandra Kravchuk, I'm the co-editor of the Commons uh, channel, and today we're continuing our conference dedicated to um, fair, just renewal, and we are talking first of all about energy questions and the environment. So a few technical remarks first. Um, people who joined us in Zoom, uh, you can choose the uh, channel you need, English or Ukrainian. Um, our speakers, a big request, please try to speak slowly in order to establish um, good conditions for interpretation. And then if our um, listeners have any kind of questions, please post them into comments and we'll ask them later. So um, the general framework that the moderator is supposed to introduce at the start of the discussion is an easy thing for me to do because one third of uh, all energy units, the infrastructure, and this has been damaged by Ukrainian shelling and missile strikes. So we have this um, schedule of blackouts in Ukraine. And against this backdrop, we talk about um, the energetic sector of Ukraine today and how this energy sector should function after the war, how we could change the Ukrainian and the world energy system, how we can lessen our dependencies on those corporations and countries that today rely on fossil fuels. Um, of course, um, Russia is one of them. So how do we decrease our dependency as um, the countries of the global south from the core countries uh, in order for us to be able during the green transition to just pay for the green new solutions or introduce perhaps some um, carbon tax and of course, we are going to also talk about the oil and gas dependencies um, that many countries have from Russia. Um, this is something that is true in Ukraine and in Europe in general. Let me also introduce our panelists. Uh, we have many interesting experts with us today. They are uh, Marina Larina. She is a research on climate change and climate politics. Simon Pironi, a historian from Britain, a research in the energy sphere, a writer, a socialist writer. We also have Lesha Karlik with us. He is a climate activist from Poland and also a member of the energy policy group of the Polish party Razum together. And then we also have with us Christian Zeller, professor of economic geography in Salzburg. And he is also looking into the question of energy and economy alternatives. So let's probably start. And the floor is given, first of all, to Marina Larina. She is the author of many publications uh, published in Ukrainian uh, in the Commons Journal, um, in particular on the um, green and just transition, meaning um, the kind of transition that takes into account the interests of people receiving, consuming the energy. And I uh, will ask uh, how to talk about the energy transition and how Ukraine today is being part of the general European trend, um, the Green Deal, the European New Green Deal, and uh, which perhaps problems this um, gives us. Um, so Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you for your invitation today. I would most uh, like to focus on the future and to look at how the reconstruction of Ukraine, post-war reconstruction, new green reconstruction of Ukraine could take place. Um, it's interesting to note that based on my experience, um, so I'm in Germany now and have been here for quite some time on permanent basis, so I'm uh, watching all the discussions about Ukraine and the war. And this is what I interested recent, uh, this is what I noticed uh, recently. The topic of post-war reconstruction of Ukraine is actually being quite widely discussed um, in press, in media, uh, from the political perspective, uh, from the point of view of certain European politicians and states, and then in the public sector, uh, different kinds of organizations like humanitarian aid organizations are also talking about these issues. But I noticed that these discussions are basically absent among the European left. I mean, the discussions to do with Ukraine basically are centered on the um, uh, 
weapons, for example, or sanctions uh, against Russia, but it's a pity that when Ukraine is being discussed, people are not talking about the um, future, about the prospects of finding some common ground, finding topics where people um, would not really, when we talk about ordinary um, citizens, feel helpless. So talking about the damage incurred by the war, um, talking about stopping all of this in order to empower people to make them feel that they are not passive and they are not helpless in this situation. Generally, why do I want to talk about the European Union today and the dynamics of relationships between the EU and Ukraine? Why is this important? An important question for the green reconstruction after the war. Well, obviously, the European Union plays a very and has been playing a very important role even before the war um, because Ukraine signed this association agreement and is now um, going to slowly go towards becoming a member of the European Union. And generally, the EU will obviously play a, an important role in the post-war rebuilding of Ukraine. Of course, there are many other Europe actors apart from that. Um, international organizations, the United States of America, etc. But the EU in particular and the um, direction of our movement chosen by Ukraine, I would say that it will play a very important role in uh, what we got uh, in the post war period, what kind of reconstruction happens, how it happens, it, and so on. Also, the relevance comes from the fact that from the point of view of our economic activity on the international level, the export has been a 39 or 40 percent. If we look at the experts from Ukraine into the European Union, so European Union is the main direction of export for us right now um, because of the blockade of the uh, seaports and so on, um, the EU is becoming more and more important for Ukraine in terms of exporting goods. Um, so I would say that there are many different definitions when it comes to reconstruction, um, green reconstruction and so on. Basically, what underlines the green reconstruction as a concept is the idea of rebuilding based on the economic model, based on um, low carbon principles, many people think that this is um, greatly related to the European New Green Deal and the program to um, reach net zero emissions and carbon neutrality uh, until 2015, uh, the program which is uh, targeting the carb carbon emissions in energy, uh, in the energy sector, in different industries, and on the, on the level of, for example, cars and houses, everyday use of energy. So generally we notice that uh, when people look at the question of the new Green Deal, um, it's becoming a very um, widely discussed and topical issue. Um, pressure are, is growing within the, United, um, within the United European community. There are discussions between different member states, and then there is a lot of pressure on um, those countries that um, have uh, signed the association agreements or are on the way to become the members. So the climate perspective, the focus on, on this Green Deal is growing in terms of um, the EU's relationship with other countries, not just its members. And then the test phase of the um, carbon correction uh, mechanism is uh, starting um, being implemented. This will become... Um, something that all the importers uh, working with the EU um, will also be uh, influenced by. So it's this kind of carbon tax basically, which will be measured according to the carbon price in EU. A great request for this speaker um, to start maybe speaking more slowly if possible. So, um, the carbon tax would be measured and established based on the CO2 price in the European Union today. Uh, it fluctuates between approximately 60 and 80 euro, um, and the peak was uh, 98 euro in August. Um, 
So um, this will be implemented in approximately five industries that are very um, that consume a lot of energy, like iron, steel, aluminum, and fertilizers, and the energy sector, and so on. If we look at the uh, export uh, between Ukraine and the EU um, recently, then we can see that um, these spheres actually in some um, other industries, um, like for example, um, minerals and, and so on, basically this part has amounted to approximately uh, 40 percent of the general export um, from Ukraine to the European Union, which means that um, these industries, um, these sectors are very important, quite important for Ukrainian export and they will be they will be taxed, us, so, so to speak, um, on the side of the issue. So European producers, manufacturers will have to pay this kind of carbon tax um, to buy the certificates uh, from the European Union in order to be able to export their goods um, from Ukraine uh, to the um, EU. Why, from a different perspective, is this also important? Because Ukraine... Um, has suffered from a lot of damage. Um, there is no clear assessment on all of the damage, including the damage to the uh, environment. But anyway, it's clear that um, Alexandra mentioned this at the start, um, the alternative energy infrastructure. And also, if we look at some particular industries like the iron and steel industry, which amounts to a great part of Ukrainian export, and these uh, um, sectors suffered from enormous damage, like the Mariupol Ilich um, iron and steel works, for example. Um, this amounted to basically the 40% of Ukrainian iron and steel production. So it's clear that on the one hand, we have um, the regulatory pressures um, from the outside on Ukraine, and on the other hand, we have and this momentum, um, this wind of opportunity for Ukraine because of those regulatory um, requirements to uh, step, uh, to make a step into a different direction from the direction it has been going in. So um, what do we understand as a green reconstruction? Um, I would say that in Ukraine, the vision is not particularly clear. Uh, when people in Ukraine discuss this, the authorities we are talking about pox, for example, or expanding the territories, spaces, uh, green spaces. So there is this um, unclear understanding of what um, simplified understanding of what climate uh, policy could be, uh, the Green Deal policy could be. If we look at what the EU, the European Union is saying when it talks about the green reconstruction, then we clearly uh, understand that there are some interests that the European Union would like to pursue. There are some priorities for them in this sphere. And it's um, clear that uh, the European Union would be in interested for Ukraine to also pursue those um, directions. So we are talking about the rebuilding of infrastructure and ro roads and houses uh, generally without any clear tie to the green reconstruction, which is something that is necessary. Um, we have to do this in Ukraine. But on the other hand, uh, in the context of green reconstruction, uh, we are talking about the reconstruction of the energy sector, but also about expanding the use of renewable sources of energy in Ukraine. Um, there are many studies right now saying that Ukraine has this great space that it could use, um, which is not right now being used for wind farms and solar farms, which is right now done in the European Union and so on. So um, clearly we see that there is this interest into um, expanding the renewable energy sector in Ukraine and then exporting the energy to the European Union. After the start of the uh, full-scale war, Ukraine became part of the ENSOE, um, the electric grid um, system in the European Union, and started supplying um, 
electricity to the European Union and the trade capacities have actually been uh, growing during the recent month, but after the um, missile attacks from Russia in October, Ukraine temporarily stopped supplying um, electricity to the European Union because of the great damage that um, Ukrainian energy structure, infrastructure uh, incurred. And if we look at all the priorities um, in the European Union in terms of green reconstruction, then hydrogen is um, the so-called green hydrogen is um, uh, one of the top priorities for the European Union. So we mean the hydrogen produced based on renewable energy sources and then exported into the European Union. Before the war, Ukraine has played an important part in this strategy for the European Union. Uh, generally, this priority um, is important in terms of uh, European Union's cooperation with countries of Eastern Partnership, um, North Africa, like Morocco, for example, um, even after the start of the war. Um, is you Ukraine, um, even after the start of the war, we're talking about this um, direction of development because we're pursuing the independence um, from Russia, Russian oil and gas. And so um, we are talking about um, Europe also not being dependent on the um, fossil fuel um, export from Russia. So in the context of Ukraine, the production of this green hydrogen is seen as very important. This was a point discussed uh, during the Lugano conference um, in terms of um, Ukraine's reconstruction after the war. So a lot of attention is paid to uh, green hydrogen, perhaps more attention than this um, deserves. If we generally look at the situation in Ukraine, um, the current situation. But anyway, um, this is a priority and this is how the um, green reconstruction is seen in, in the EU. Uh, what, do we, what do we need for reconstruction apart from these um, things? Um, without um, regarding the vision of the European Union or U Ukrainian government to generalizing what we need, first of all, this is financing. Uh, we need assessment, of course, and current assessment uh, is quite different. According to the World Bank, we are talking about um, 350 billions. Um, according to other sources, we need um, more than one um, trillion euro, etc. So while the war is ongoing, there is no clear and final assessment. And of course, the damage is still being done. Um, anyway, the financing, the funds we're talking about, um, this should be based on um, grant funds because the uh, external debt is growing, the national debt is growing, and the loans will not um, help towards um, just green reconstruction in Ukraine in the interest of the people of Ukraine. Um, the energy sector, we need to focus on the renewable renewable sources of energy, and they will play a significant role in Ukraine's um, independence and decarbonization. But this is not something that we need to think only in terms of, think about only in terms of export. We also need to think about how Ukraine could rely on those sources for its own needs. Um, the question of housing is very important. Do we build a lot of housing right now? Um, and this is something that we can do quicker and cheaper, or do we build houses more slowly? But um, they would be uh, more modern in terms of, for example, energy efficiency and so on. And there are a lot of discussions about that, but anyway, we understand that the building, the construction sector is also important for many, um, for a great number of emissions. So we could uh, and should uh, think how uh, construction, reconstruction of old damaged houses or construction of new ones could be uh, conducted. Um, so for example, the state, the National Fund of uh, Energy Efficiency started this pilot project on building 60 houses based on great funds in Kyiv, Suma, Zhitomer and Chernihiv regions. Um, and um, the grant money we have right now for this is 5 million euro, which is not enough to um, finish this project and also to scale it um, in all of Ukraine um, 
And then there is the sphere of transport. Um, the European Union and the Ukrainian government alike are not very uh, keen not to talk about the railway um, uh, network's development. This is something that is mentioned, but not a priority for some reason. But we do see that the railways played, an important, played and continue to play an important part in Ukraine during the war. Uh, in terms of evacuation, for example, the railway infrastructure which we have in Ukraine makes it very logical to expand the railway um, network in Ukraine to modernize it. And the European Union has also some problems with railways, not of the scale we have in Ukraine. Um, so if we look at Germany, for example, their situation is quite similar to, Europe, uh, to our Ukrainian situation with railway networks being decreased, the being cut, if we look at the 90s um, and look at now, we can see clearly that um, the development and railway networks is not a priority in the European Union, um, as well as in Ukraine. So um, it's important to take um, this into account um, making while making plans for reconstruction. It's not just about energy efficiency and climate, for example, efficiency, um, and climate protection, we also need to think about um, labor standards and uh, how they should be implemented in Ukraine, because Ukraine, after all, is um, on its way to become the member of the European Union. Thank you. And this is the end of my speech. I'd like our speakers to pay attention to the time limit, but um, it's a very interesting speech anyway, there are different ways to become integrated into the European community, obviously, and that all depends on the political will which exists in a certain country and the political will of the um, Ukrainian leadership. So I hope that the movement to the European Green New Deal will also take into account Ukrainian interest. And I would like to give the floor to Simon Prani, who is also um, a great defender of Ukraine and Ukrainian resistance. We have um, been publishing his um, articles also on the pages of our journal, and we would ask uh, Simon to talk in detail about the requirements, um, what has to be paid attention to by progressive movements both in Ukraine and abroad when we talk about the um, fight against dependency, tackling the dependency um, from Russia in terms of resources. Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Um, before I start, I want to say I have not uh, visited Ukraine since the invasion in February, and I only understand the difficulties that uh, you started off with, um, particularly in the last week with the bombing of the uh, power stations and other infrastructure. I only understand those difficulties at second hand. And I think it's very difficult to talk about post-war reconstruction while the war is raging as it is uh, now. Uh, but that discussion has started. Uh, it started at government level at the Lugano conference between the Ukrainian government and the European governments. And in my view, the labor movement and social movements need an approach that takes the side of working people, that takes the side of society as opposed to economic and political elites. So I'll just highlight four principles that I think can help to develop such an approach. The first principle is that energy should be supplied mainly from renewable sources. Uh, Marina has uh, spoken about this. <clears throat> Society internationally needs an energy transition to a system without uh, fossil fuels. That means it will have to be centered on electricity networks with the electricity generated from uh, sources such as solar, wind, and wave power. That applies internationally, and it applies because of global heating. And I'm sure everybody uh, who's listening today understands that. Um, I just want to underline that for the last 30 years, the world's most powerful governments 
have gone to great lengths to delay this energy transition, while at the same time pretending to deal with the problem. <laughs> so the labor movement and social movements need <laughs> to advocate a transition that serves our interests, that serves the interests of society and not the interests of capital. Two points about Ukraine specifically. The first is about coal. And as we all know, the Donbass was built on coal. The use of coal has already been falling since 2016, mainly due to Russian aggression. But now there is a discussion in the Donbass, I think it's very welcome, uh, about a future without coal. There's an open letter by the mayors of Mirnachrad, Chervonachrad and other towns. And I think as the labor movement, we should engage with that discussion. Second about gas. The government has actually sought to reduce dependence on Russian gas, and there have been no direct imports since 2015. But in Ukraine, as elsewhere, gas companies make the false argument that gas is part of the solution to the problem of greenhouse gas emissions because it, you get more energy with fewer emissions than coal. But actually, gas is part of the problem. The energy transition means moving away from gas. And in Ukraine, that's a, a tough task. The second principle is that it's in society's interest to cut the flow of energy through technological systems. To understand this, we should first forget the idea of energy demand. People do not want energy. They want things that energy provides. They want heat, they want light, electricity to run their computers, the ability to travel and so on. And these things can be provided using far less energy than is used now by making better use of technologies. Technologies that have already existed for decades. An obvious example is heat from people's homes. In Ukraine, this comes mainly from uh, gas boilers or district heating systems. This is a problem that we can start tackling now. The first thing is that homes can be insulated. The second thing is that electric heat pumps can replace gas boilers. This would keep people warm, which is what those people want, but it would cut greenhouse gas emissions. These technologies are pretty simple, even though retrofitting them to old buildings can be tricky. Now, these are short-term measures, but we should link these with longer-term measures. And here, the creation of integrated urban energy systems is a priority. In such systems, you have multiple inputs of renewable energy, and these are integrated with energy storage facilities. The final point is that I think it's very good that some uh, environmentalist organizations in Ukraine have started to have advanced the idea just this year of what they call <clears throat> energy freedom, uh, which they define as, quote, this is their words, the greatest possible freedom for citizens, organizations and communities to produce energy and manage it in their own economies, unquote. I think that is a discussion also that we in the labor movement should participate in. What does that mean in practice? Community energy as opposed to energy controlled by and provided by the state. The third principle is that we should demand that fuels and electricity are treated as services, as rights for all, not as commodities. This is a long-standing principle of the European labor movement going back uh, for many decades. And this must be our starting point uh, in the question of how energy is provided to households as a right, not as a commodity. The fourth point is that we should favor technologies that are compatible with our aims of social justice. And we should resist technologies that serve the state and capital. 
the EU's Green New Deal has been mentioned by Marina. In my view, the EU is preparing for a limited shift to renewable energy supply, but a shift that protects powerful energy corporations and liberalized markets. Many Ukrainian politicians are happy with this political framework and the technological choices it implies, but I think we should not be happy with it. For example, the proposal that Marina mentioned to produce electricity from uh, renewable energy in Ukraine and export it. From Ukraine's point of view, this would be crazy. There are no benefits to Ukraine uh, from this proposal. It, at the Lugano conference, there was talk of spending billions and billions of euros uh, to do this. The renewable energy solar and wind which should be produced in Ukraine and there is great potential for this should be used to supply Ukraine's own electricity to replace gas and coal to produce it for hydrogen for export would be a form of neo-colonialism another live political issue is whether new nuclear plants should be built specifically Khmelnytsky 3 and Khmelnytsky 4. This is in the interest of some Ukrainian politicians, but it is not in the interest of society. It is feasible to aim for a system that provides electricity that Ukraine needs from re renewable sources without nuclear. So if money, if again, billions of euros is put into Khmelnytsky 3 and Khmelnytsky 4, this will not be going into other alternatives which are better from a social point of view. Now, of course, behind this, there are broader arguments about whether and how nuclear power should be part of post fossil fuel energy systems at all. I am not enthusiastic about it because it is by nature bound up with powerful state and military structures. By contrast, decentralized renewable technologies, which is what all the engineers in the electricity industry today are discussing and researching, those decentralized renewable technologies are by their nature compatible with collect collective egalitarian ways of organizing society. That is socialist ways of organizing society. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Дякую, Саймон. Я сподіваюся, у нас зараз буде ще дискусія стосовно атомної енергетики. Thank you, Simon. I expect a discussion about nuclear energy today as well, because we have various representatives today who represent various approaches. As for your demands, you have four demands. Yes, I appreciate them. They're quite radical, but the theme is uh, this movement, this movement of subjects. It hasn't been created as of yet in Ukraine. It wasn't well established. That's why we mostly hope to get some pressure from abroad, from the organizations that can install these demands, can speak on international level as of energy policy in Ukraine. So, I think that the next speaker, Lesha Karlik, it's great that he's next to speak. He has been dealing with energy questions for quite a long time. He will be speaking about a thing not quite so popular, about nuclear energy and the way it can be safe, safe assistance in energy transition to energy independence. So, Leszek, the floor is yours, and please stick to the agenda, to the schedule, and guys, keep on writing your comments on Facebook and in Zoom chat, we'll speak. Okay, Leszek, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I have shared the screen, can you see it? 
Okay, so Dequio, I will be speaking about nuclear energy and renewable energy today. Uh, this is electrical synchronous grid shown here on this map. Our, oh, sorry. Zoom has, oh, okay. Zoom has decided to show photos of people over my controls, sorry. Oh. Electrical synchronous grids, which are presented here on this map, are the largest machines ever built by mankind. And they're a triumph of collective action on a continent-wide scale. Incidentally, this map here is not current because soon after the full-scale Russian invasion, Ukrainian grid operators have managed to successfully synchronize Ukrainian grid with European NSOE, which is an heroic feat that would normally take years of careful work. Unfortunately, electricity worldwide is still generated mostly from fossil fuels. And as we can see here, the situation is not changing rapidly. And we needed to change rapidly in order to avoid a global catastrophe that will last for many centuries. Because unlike most graphs, global heating will continue past 200, 2100. Europe is relatively advanced in decarbonization. Over half of our electricity is non-fossil and nuclear was the largest single low carbon source in 2019 before the pandemic. Then the energy use got a bit wonky, so I'm using statistics from 2019. Ukraine has a very advanced nuclear power sector. Before the full-scale invasion, over half its electricity came from nuclear, and the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant, which is now occupied by Russian invaders and shut down, is the largest nuclear plant in Europe. Still, one quarter of Ukrainian electricity before the war came from coal. And after Ukraine wins and starts rebuilding its economy, it will need to build a clean and low emissions energy grid. This will give rise to discussions. Uh, do we want to rapidly build our renewables only? Uh, and do we want to shut down nuclear power plants as dangerous? Or do we want to build more nuclear power plants and not build any renewables? Renewables make sense, as you can see on this screen. Solar, wind, are getting cheaper and cheaper with each year. Although now with the global supply chain disruptions and China being on the fence in the conflict between Ukraine and Western democracies on one side and Russia's fascist regime on the other, the costs may unfortunately go back up or just stop dropping as rapidly. But wind and solar, even with low costs, have the problem of intermittency because interseasonal storage, electricity storage does not exist yet. And at our latitudes, there's a more than tenfold difference in the amount of electricity generated on a best sunny spring day, this is this red curve here, and the amount of electricity generated on a worst dark January day, which is this blue curve on, in the bottom. Uh, it, the situation is completely different in countries like in Africa because they are much more closer to the equator. We don't have interseasonal energy storage and we will not have grid scale storage facilities for at least two decades because they're very slow to, the, to implement on large scale. And while on the average winds are slightly stronger in the winter months, this is only an average. And continent wide week long periods of low winds during winter still occur. So we need a complement and a nuclear power, nuclear power would be a perfect complement to a low energy grid. Uh, you can look on Google Scholar for papers on hybrid nuclear renewables grids if you're interested, because despite what, of what some opponents are saying, modern nuclear plants are perfectly capable of load following. This is a diagram of French nuclear production during the pandemic when it had to follow load follow wind production. And we need all the tools in the toolbox to decarbonize because while it is easy to build a single wind turbine or install one solar farm, grid scale deployments of massive renewable energy installations are not fast enough and still fail to match the rate of decarbonization of historical nuclear deployments in Sweden or France or Finland. 
And decarbonization of electricity so far needs firm power sources, ones that are available on demand, whether it's nuclear or hydro or geothermal. And hydro is extremely dangerous, as we can see now with the war. So what about the problems of nuclear? Because, of course, there are problems. Every energy source has its problems. The biggest problem really is cost. But the cost of nuclear is driven by the cost of capital. And in case of Ukraine, nuclear that has been already built is extremely cheap to operate. What Ukraine will need is money for lifetime extensions, because we now know that pressurized water reactors, and Ukraine now operates only PWRs, can have their life extended for six and maybe even eight decades. But the biggest perceived problems are the risk of accidents and radiation leaks and the issue of nuclear waste. The risk of another Chernobyl was one of the factors that helped the anti-war and anti-nuclear weapons pro-environmental movements stop the expansion of nuclear power in the 1980s and 1990s. The other being, of course, dark money and ads from fossil fuel companies. For example, these three leaflets that I'm showing are from American Petroleum Institute, Oil Heat Institute, and Australian Coal Miner Unions. But the facts are well known now. Modern nuclear power is extremely safe per unit of energy generated. Basically, we're too far afraid of radiation risks and not afraid enough of air pollution, which, according to latest research, kills at least 9 million people a year globally. And yes, Chernobyl was a terrible accident. But a brown coal power plant over its lifetime will kill many, many more people than Chernobyl did. It will do so with air pollution. We're just very, very used to people dying of lung cancer caused by breathing in smoke. Homo sapiens is not good at, at assessing abstract risks because it was not an evolutionary requirement. And we have solutions for nuclear waste too. We can store it in long-term depositories like Onkalo in Finland. And when we build fourth generation nuclear power plants later in this century, we can use nuclear waste that is spent nuclear uh, fuel as fuel again. Technological solutions have existed for a long time, but their implementations has been blocked by anti-nuclear power political movements so that they can point at nuclear waste and say this issue has not been solved yet. Uh, for example, if you look at the history of Yucca Mountain in the US. And the most dangerous nuclear waste comes from nuclear weapons programs. Do we want a world without nuclear weapons? Certainly we do. But do we want a world where the Western democracies have no nuclear weapons because they democratically decided to get rid of them? But Putin's Russia does have nuclear weapons? Certainly not. I mean, anti-war activists had their hearts in the right places, but imagine a world where France and UK and the US had no nuclear weapons, or well, the US empire wouldn't get rid of its nukes, but let's say it's ruled by another Trump, an isolationist who doesn't care about Ukraine. So imagine Putin advancing on Kiev and saying that any stiff resistance will be met with tactical nukes, and if Europe starts helping too much, it will get nuked too. We live in a world with nuclear weapons, unfortunately, and have to deal with that reality. So they will be here with us for decades and a lot of nuclear waste too. So we have to somehow manage it. And one final thing concerning waste. The only accident with civilian nuclear waste that killed humans occurred with medical waste, a cesium chloride radiotherapy source in Goania in Brazil. But I never in my life saw Greenpeace picketing an oncology ward and demanding we stop treating cancer with radioactivity since we now have chemotherapy. Nuclear power doesn't treat cancer, but it actually prevents cancer by displacing fossil fuels and reducing air pollution. And we have to keep in mind that every nuclear power plant that operates now in Europe reduces the demand for fossil fuels from despots like either Vladimir Putin or Mohammed bin Salman. In March of this year, an, an environmental NGO called Replanet has created a switch of Putin social media campaign showing how to store, stop importing Russian gas and how to reverse, uh, basically reversing nuclear phase outs in Germany, Sweden and Belgium was a part of this plan because it reduces gas demand. So 
when nuclear energy builds, we need to keep nuclear on and we need to build both renewables and nuclear. And what we really need to demand is for West to aid Ukraine in this rebuilding effort by financing both kinds of investments. Because in modern day, getting money is relatively easy. What really restricts our ability to stop emitting greenhouse gases are supply chains and physical resources, such as uranium, steel, and concrete on one hand for nuclear and rare earth metals, lithium, cobalt, and copper on the other hand for renewables. So we really need both because supply chains and resource demands of nuclear power do not have a significant overlap with supply chains and resource demands of renewables. So, thank you. Дякую, дякую, Лешек. Справді складно говорити про Thank you, Лешек. Yes, it's difficult to talk about the development of nuclear energy sector in Ukraine because for me personally and for my generation, we are all um, affected by Chernobyl. My father was one of the people, um, the emergency responder uh, to the Chernobyl catastrophe. But at the same time, I understand that today the nuclear energy is the last barrier today, which prevents um, is Ukrainian energy sector from completely being destroyed. But on the other hand, we are clearly uh, in need of new technologies and looking into different alternatives, like, for example, combining the nuclear energy with the renewable energy resources in order to diversify energy supply to make it safe and to make it affordable and also uh, environmentally friendly. I understand that this, this is a controversial, perhaps, opinion, something that is open to discussions. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Uh, so, Leszek, thank you. And Christian Zeller now has the place. He is a professor of economic geography from um, Salzburg. We would like to invite him to talk about this global perspective, um, about the issues faced today by eco-social activists around the world. So how can we think the world without its dependency on Russia and fossil fuel in general? Um, seeing this fossil fuel model as something of the past, which is no longer topical. So Christian, the floor is yours. Uh, good. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have an exchange with you and uh, bring in together quite different perspectives and even also quite different suggestions. My starting point uh, is a little bit different from just the previously presented starting points, but I will be trying. I just uh, have uh, prepared a, a presentation, just a moment. You see it? Okay, my, my starting point is uh, just a moment. Okay, I I will combine three points. Some general challenges. Uh, I make it very broad. <laughs> that this gives me the the opportunity to to trying to design a quite radical answer. Then I will make some remarks to current energy struggles, mostly mostly focused on Germany because this is a quite important political issue and then I, I make some suggestions on the eco-socialist orientation. My starting point is the following. The main demand of the climate movement to limit global warming on 1.5 or at least 2 degrees or a little bit, a little bit more can only be realized if a radical industrial conversion and even dismantling programs are implemented in the most important capitalist or early industrialized countries, 
however, including, of course, China and Russia. Of course, this is not achievable under the given uh, power relations and without breaking with the capitalist logic of profit, of competition, of accumulation and growth. The big corporation, so the big fossil corporations, they will not be willing to let the capital linked to fossil fuels and all subsequent industries to be devalued. So this is a, a major contradiction. And this contradiction is not solvable. It's a hard, it's an antagonistic uh, contradiction. What's the broader context? And this, I think we are in a very special period in a very in a unique uh, historical period uh, that combines different crises. Uh, oh, sorry, someone, someone was calling me. We have uh, a broad uh, economic crisis. So all ingredients that uh, provoked the financial crisis 2008, 9, and 10 subsequent years, they are all still here. Nothing has been fundamentally resolved of, of these of the economic crisis. And the crisis we are faced now already started uh, basically before the pandemic began. The pandemic increased the crisis, and now in the current situation with war, and so uh, we will face. Uh, Pro, it's highly likely that we face a, a new step, uh, a recession, or even a deep crisis. But this is in the context of a major crisis of our, our entire social metabolism with nature. And this, of course, is linked to the question of the Anthropocene. So we are in a, in a stage of the Earth history that we left or leaving we are left the stable conditions of the Holocene of 11,000 years. And the Holocene, the configuration of the Holocene enabled us this, the civiliz all civilizations we, we, so far, we know eh? from the Neolithic revolution until uh, the nuclear power station period. But that's gone. This stable configuration is gone. And now we are in a very a uh, unique situation that the conditions of the Earth system, the dynamics of the Earth system, the physical environment is changing within one generation. All previous generation had stable environmental conditions, at least on one generation. Now we face a situation that the Earth system is changing almost more quickly, faster that, than the societies are able to learn. That's a, that's a major problem. And we've also faced, I think, some kind of leadership crisis among the capitalist ruling classes. They, even they, they do, they, the, the, all kinds of problems that come together, they are so broad that they do not find real solutions. This leads to increasing geopolitical rivalries and tensions, or war for uh, power markets, even wars for resources and the ecological things and this is combined with the crisis of ecological uh, with political representation and of course and unfortunately it's also linked to a crisis of alternatives what do we say to this entire mess and my th i think the problem is much broader much deeper that it could be solved with technical answers yeah so so we are in a situation that the ecological question determines all social conflicts and every social debate on wages, social infrastructure, and so on, is also a debate about the social metabolism of nature. And every debate about our metabolism of nature is also one about the organization of our uh, society. Uh, so what's, we have a huge societal and political challenge. How do we close the gigantic gap between the urgent measures and the broad awareness, consciousness of the working population of the situation and what needs to be done? How do we contribute to uh, 
the working population, the workers gaining awareness of their own possibilities of action and shaping the situation. Uh, Lesek already mentioned the different uh, scenarios of the IPCC. And if the, the policies the governments promised have, will be really implemented, what's by no means sure, we will enter into a more or less three degree, 3.5 degree Earth system. Yeah? That will mean that we will step over different kinds of tipping points of the Earth system. So the, the, the mainstream policies that are planned or scheduled are by no means a solution of the problems. They will increase the problem. Of, uh, we, so this will be likely a scenario in, in, this, uh, in this direction. If we follow the, for instance, the prognosis of the OPEC or the International Energy um, Organization, we will even face, we will, we, we will go on in a, in a, yes, in a, in a massive continuation of, of the global warming situation. Huh? Uh, so in the prognosis of the OPEC, for instance, oil will remain a major energy source Today, it's about 30%. They say that in 2045, it will be still at about 28%. Uh, and that's of even the, that's linked, of course, the major problem is the, the growth, the growth economy. It's the pressure, the, the, the constraint of the capitalist uh, growth that's Problem, that's the major issue that will increase the material throughput of our of our society of our economy, and that will lead us in a in a situation in a scenario on three more three or even more uh, degree global warming uh, corresponding to the uh, IPCC scenarios. So that's a broad const the, the broad context. Now I, I skip uh, to the current situation in Germany. And this is very linked to, of course, the, the energy question and the gas question and the strategic alliance. Some parts of German capital have been engaged with uh, fossil industries in, in Russia. Here you see the, the price development of, uh, of electricity. But what is very what's obvious that the, the price increases of electricity already started before the war. That's a very important statement because many people, right-wing currents, but even left-wing currents in Germany say the whole mess is a, is a product of the sanctions against uh, Russia. Uh, here we see the export volume of Russian gas to different countries and you you see clearly that germany of course was a major buyer of uh, russian gas the natural gas consumption in germany in the previous 30 years increased uh, here you see the the situation if you if you have a closer look we see that even in, in specific industries it um, increased even more. And Russia was, has been or was the most important, important provider for gas in, for the German economy. So here you see the, pr the price development in the previous years of gas. And of course, this is linked to the war, but not only. Already before the war started, the price of energy, also of gas, in, increased. Here you see the composition of consumption of gas. And that's very important to understand the German uh, conflicts or within Germany. Uh, of course, we have a broad, of the right-hand side, you see the, the household part. And on the left-hand side, you see the industrial part. And there is even one part where gas is needed for the industrial processes, not, not just for heating, but for the 
material in the material industrial processes. So that's a, a key. It's a, it's a strategic important issue. So I cannot go deeper into the into these issues, but my major argument is that there has been a, a long-standing, far-reaching strategic alliance between parts of the German capital with Gazprom and the, the Russian uh, fossil capital. Eh? We could discuss this later, but that's a major, and that's this partially explains, I only say partially explains the German uh, uh, political debates. What's going on right now? There's, uh, of course, uh, people are suffering from the increase of energy prices, and there are different mobilizations going on, or different uh, alliances has been have been formed. One is called Heating Bread Freedom. <laughs> Do you remember the Russian Revolution? They argue hard, hardly against sanctions for price caps. And some of their exponents are even in favor of reopening North Stream. In in order, in they they argue for uh, peace talks with Russia, and some of them openly defend some kind of Russian position. There's another alliance. It's a copy from the British or the UK campaign. Enough is enough. Uh, there are people linked to the journal Jacobin. They just copy the British campaign into the German context. They, they say nothing about the war. They say nothing about ecology. They just focus on price gaps, public private of, of the uh, on public uh, payments. Sorry, this is not private and social demands. There is a broader alliance that has been formed. They uh, uh, organize right today and this day broad demonstrations. Uh, from labor unions, environmental organizations, and interestingly, their demands are quite moderate, but they include an environmental dimension, and they even include uh, some, in a broad sense of the word, uh, solidarity with Ukraine, and of course there are many local alliances. But what's now uh, a current, I would say, eco-socialist orientation? And this eco-socialist orientation has to bring together three pillars, which are equally important. We have to go, the starting point are the planetary boundaries, the tipping points, and the need for radical ecological conversions. We have to combine this, of course, with the social struggles I just mentioned, and we combine with the transnational and global solidarity and convergence. I think it's very concrete in the, in the current debates. Of course, it's important to defend wages. So in the sense of a classical demand, a retrospective automatic cost of living adjustment. In Italian, it's called scala mobile. However, this demand is also problematic if the composition of consumption is not challenged. Yeah? So we have to think on both dimensions. Of course, price gaps are important but they need to be carefully designed in order to prevent that they are just subsidies for industries. And uh, also I think what uh, already in UK is happening, don't pay campaigns and these kinds of uh, sorts health can help to improve the degree of uh, self-organization. But then, and here I come, I'm quite close to Simon, I think a key orientation is to extend the social infrastructure. That's really a key, a key, a strategic key uh, demand. So cheap provision of basic energy, but linked with the progressive higher prices for higher consume consumption, extending public health care, care in the broadest sense of the word, education, public transport, including health insurances, social insurances, housing. So the perspective a city of short distances. Why it is important? Because it's possible to, to combine different issues, to reduce energy consumption. And I am strict on that. We have to reduce in absolute terms, in absolute figure, the energy consumption. That we cannot find just technological solutions. We have to push back the, 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 the commodity logic and we have to promote 
self-organizations in the society. A major precondition or accompanying perspective of that is, of course, the industrial conversion. The, the need to convert and partially or it even largely dismantle industries like the car industry and electric cars are not an alternative. They are highly uh, resource consumption. Uh, they need. Uh, they are not ecological. They are. Uh, they they consume uh, all kinds of resources, um, and this has to be linked with campaigns for uh, what I call democratic social appropriation. So, uh, socialization of the entire energy sector. In Germany, there's an interesting campaign more linked, uh, launched by the climate movement, RWE and Eignen, so this appropriate RV, RWE, this one major energy uh, transnational. And this has to be combined, combined with this perspective of conversion. And I think that's a key issue now. I think really we have to discuss how energy consumption and material throughput in the broad sense uh, can be reduced, mostly in the early industrialized, I call imperialist countries. That's not a recipe for other countries. Eh? So I'm, I'm strict on that. That's, that's our job in our rich countries. Eh? <laughs> and the third point, and here I end, it's of course the, the, the global perspective of global solidarity. What does it mean? The, uh, the societies of the early industrialized countries have a much higher responsibility for the, for the uh, emission of greenhouse gases than the entire rest of the world. So they need to reduce much more quickly and much more extensively the greenhouse gases. We need to introduce uh, the question of compensation and payment of ecological debt towards the global south and even to probably also to some Eastern European countries. Uh, in a very concrete and current uh, situation, we have to combine this with some kind of demand that no payment for Putin's war. So that's strict. So no provision of oil, of gas and so on uh, from Russia. That's highly contradictory in, in Germany, for instance, or even in other countries. And probably this is linked to what Marina and Simon uh, already have uh, introduced. How do we combine solidarity relations in the perspective of reconstruction of Ukraine? How we in, in Switzerland and Austria and Germany and France and UK can exert pressure on companies, on transnationals, on governments to influence and to shape their investment behavior in, in Ukraine or even in other countries. Yeah? So how can we create direct linkages uh, from movements in other countries with uh, unions, with environmental uh, movement in Ukraine, for instance, linked to the hydrogen question that uh, Simon already mentioned. And how can we uh, develop some kind of broader international, transnational perspective of a real radical social ecological uh, transition? But of course, the challenge is how to do it concretely. What, how can we combine the different levels of broader, of long-term perspectives with very uh, actual daily uh, demands on the street in campaigns. Thank you, Christian, for this great speech. And I think you got this uh, general framework that eco-social movements can provide. You gave us the vision. Okay, it was, uh, it had so many measures about the crisis. You explained that the crisis began before the war. Yes, but I think uh, it's great that you were able to underline that we have an alternative because quite often we need to speak 
about some tactical questions, how to make slight improvements instead of speaking about major alternative. As a moment today in Ukraine, it's uh, very difficult, but we attempt to. I thought that we should start our discussion from the question about these levels that you have spoken about. So Christian and Marina, a question to you. Maybe somebody else would be good to comment. So Christian, you told us that we need to radically decrease our consumption. But in Ukraine, it's not so obvious for us because Ukraine and our counterparts from Global South that follow us on Zoom, first of all, we would like to be able to consume as much as Europe does. So we have a question. I don't want to moralize a lot, but still, in what way can we adapt these requirements of green course that Marina has spoken about? And should we make a note that Ukraine has some different conditions? Who would be able then to compensate these different conditions of transition? That is, we have degrowth in different conditions. We have a different starting point. So, Christian, could you say a few words about that? Please stick to the agenda, five minutes only. A floor to you, Christian. Okay, thank you very much for this question. Of course, I completely agree. Uh, uh, my arguments are valid for the early industrialized imperialist countries. Eh? So that's yeah. our in that's our responsibility. Eh? In <laughs> I'm I'm born in a very rich country in Switzerland. So that's <laughs> that's our responsibility. So to be clear, eh? I do not mm -hmm. argue that some kind of degrowth perspective is valid for uh, poor countries uh, and even of course not for 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 Ukraine that's to be clear eh? and uh, I even argue that our societies have some kind of responsibility to to compensate our ecological our ecological debts towards the rest of the world and this can have different concrete expressions. For instance, of course, uh, now we have a debate on, on the debts, on the economic debts of the Ukraine. And I think uh, we, it's our responsibility in the rich countries to launch campaigns that the, the, the debts of Ukraine, for instance, are... Uh, or uh, annulated. Huh? Uh, that's that's one one of the questions. The, the other idea is that we, but that's difficult. We we have to think about how uh, the financial sector in our countries, the industrial sector, um, is engaged in strategies to extract value from other countries, including Ukraine, of course, this in, in the context of reconstruction. Then we have to think about how we can make this as a, we can campaigns or make it as a political issue. Uh, and this uh, is linked to the, what uh, Simon already uh, addressed. Uh, if, the goal of the EU, for instance, is to make Ukraine, because of the huge surface, as a cheap provider of energy or hydrogen production. Of course, we have to be against, or at least to to raise, to raise the question of the conditions of that. Huh? So, in order to argue against this all kinds of old and new forms of ex extractivism, huh? and but this kind of uh, degrowth, I don't, uh, personally, I do not use the word degrowth often because I, I, want, I want to make it more concrete. Eh? We have to 
uh, uh, convert and dismantle the automotive industry and so on and so on. And also the dismantling of the armaments industry as Lessig already <laughs> mentioned is of course the globe is a broad, it's a highly complicated issue in the current situation, but it's, it needs to be addressed on an international scale. So that's the problem is that we have to think different dimensions together. But uh, I focus that on our responsibility. Yeah. Thank you. No, I didn't have any advice for this. Thank you. I didn't really mean um, that. We do understand that the left perspective, the perspective, the positions you are taking is actually one of supporting the people mentioned by me, like people in Ukraine, uh, for instance. I wanted to uh, talk about how we could compensate or adjust this. Maybe Marina would like to add something about uh, implementing, for example, uh, the principles and requirements of the EU in Ukraine. Are there any plans? Are there any thoughts on how um, those could be adapted in order to be realized in Ukrainian post war context? I, yes, and I would like to touch upon the question you addressed the question, but very briefly. So I think it's an interesting situation regarding Ukraine. Um, when we talk about the um, global climate responsibilities, Ukraine is considered to be one of the countries that is um, supposed to be a responsible party within um, different conventions on climate change. Ukraine, together with the Western countries, is a post-war country which developed quite quickly industrially and so is responsible for a huge number of emissions during its industrial development. So as a country like that, Ukraine was a country which, for example, with the Kyoto Protocol and um, all the conventions took upon itself some responsibilities unlike some other countries of the global south. So it's an interesting question, which I think should be now analyzed from a different point of view, however, because the situation in the 90s, when the framework convention was adopted, and then there were those discussions on um, which country bears what kind of historical responsibility, if we look at the 90s and now, the situation is very different. First of all, Ukraine decreased the carbon emissions in the 1990s. Um, that was because the um, level of industrial production, industrial activity went down. The same happened uh, also on after 2015 because of the war in the Donbass. So from the point of view of responsibility, if we look at the question of the climate change, climate crisis seriously, I would say um, it does not make sense to present it as the victory of Ukraine. It's not something that happened because of a comprehensive uh, plan that Ukraine was pursuing with regard to climate change um, to decrease the emissions. But anyway, that's the fact that the uh, CO2 emissions decreased um, compared to the 1990s, I would say by some 60% and even when we look at the last climate plan, which is now um, presented every five years, we um, adopted this goal, which is a minimal goal, but still this is something that we are working towards. Um, we have decreased the carbon emissions because simply of the industrialization and then this is the first time after that when we took upon ourselves to achieve this min minimal goal in carbon emissions. So I would say we need to look at a diff a dissertation from a different perspective and telling people during the war that we need to cut carbon emissions. And this should be our priority. This is not really the right approach from strategic um, from the strategic perspective. Cutting, decreasing emissions can be done not through limiting the consumption or blackouts five hours a day, etc. I would say this can be done by uh, adopting a more reasonable policy. Let's say um, the 
mass scale implementation of energy efficiency measures in construction, transport sectors. Transport, for example, in Ukraine, to decarbonize it, you need a lot, but also it has a huge potential of decarbonization. So reforming the municipal transport and then getting rid of traffic jams and then um, thinking about how we develop the um, road network in Ukraine and instead of developing, for example, um, highways, um, focusing on developing railway infrastructure could be a possibility. And as we know, um, at the start of the war, for example, there were problems with fuel, um, gas, and so, for instance, e-transport in cities became an important resource for transporting people. So this is a possibility for cutting our carbon emissions, and this could be something that's presented for the population in a different way. People would see these measures as something that um, they can readily embrace. We need to uh, expand and we need to develop the social infrastructure and in this way at the same time we could cut carbon emissions so that should be our perspective instead of talking about the historical responsibility of ukraine as a post soviet state or economy in transition or something else i would say that after the war addressing these questions in the old way would be really a, a regressive step thank you christian thank you marina once again so my conclusion would be we need to, um, there are quite a lot of instruments we could implement. We need to think about alternatives, alternatives that actually exist in Ukraine right now. And then there is the European experience we can also rely on. Yeah, I don't like this approach, which unfortunately is also widespread in Ukraine, the approach within which we talk about historical responsibility of Ukraine, because after all, we can look at who um, contaminated the planet, polluted the plant most of all, and then pass the buck on to them. I would say that we need to think about new solutions to change what is polluting the planet right now uh, without taking into account whether Ukraine is a highly developed industrialized country or not, because otherwise that's the burden which we will have to still um, shoulder even in um, the circumstances when our economy is growing. So we need to think about some kind of global um, solutions, not based on moralizing about past responsibility, but would rely on social economic policies of the future balanced policies. And another question that I have, I would say it's a bit provocative. It's a question for Simon. I read um, some of your articles and then you also talked about this today, um, Ukraine has to uh, no longer rely on Russian gas. Uh, we stopped um, importing gas from Russia already, but on paper, nothing has changed. Uh, Ukraine uh, used the gas that um, it didn't have um, and we still do it, but on paper, it looks like we are paying other countries. But in fact, this is not what actually happens. We would like all of us to reduce our dependency on Russian gas. But then, would would we be possible? Would it be possible for us to do that in a year or two or five? It's not something that is realistic in terms of the development of renewable sources of energy. And then, if we take this logic to the extreme what will happen to the population of ukraine let's say we stop using the gas from the pipe that russia uses to supply it to europe we no longer rely on that how do we present it to the population what happens with the population so which mechanisms do you see here as possible perhaps because of course we need to fight back against um, russian imperialism and oil and gas uh, as its instruments but how could Europe perhaps support Ukraine in this. Maybe you can tell us something about the um, electricity, um, the energy um, and its supply to Ukraine. What can we done realistically in this situation when we 
cannot really um, refuse and no longer use Russian gas and the war is ongoing. So Simon, is there something you could tell us about that? Thank you. <clears throat> yes, so first point is that we need to divide up our <clears throat> understanding into short term, medium term, long term. Uh, short term, of course, uh, Ukraine, all the um, housing in Ukraine and the district heating systems, the <clears throat> combined heat and power plants, many of these rely on gas. So, of course, Ukraine needs gas, but Ukraine produces 20 billion cubic meters a year. For the most urgent consumption, this is enough. I suppose that that uh, figure will have gone down this year because of wartime. I do not know how much, but Ukraine has a lot of its own gas with which it can supply these most urgent needs. Uh, you're right that Ukraine buys gas from traders in Europe. Actually, those molecules of gas originally come from Siberia. Mm -hmm. But this is another 10 billion cubic meters. Um, it will be more expensive this year. Um, that's also a problem. So that's in the short term. In the medium term and the long term, Ukraine can make massive savings in the amount of gas it uses by making the housing stock uh, use energy more efficiently. The, these big um, housing estates where many Ukrainians live, which were built in the 1960s and 70s, at that time, this was great technology. Now it's not great technology and also it's 50, 60 years old. So the, the, the concentration should be on renewing that housing stock, uh, making it, uh, I mean, today to build a house which is zero carbon, it's simple. That's what architects learn in the first year in university. It's more difficult to retrofit an old house, but it's also possible. So we can cut, so, and this goes back to the point about energy demand. As socialists in the labor movement, let us not talk about cutting demand. It sounds as though we want everybody to go in the winter without heat. That's not what we want. What we want is for everybody to live in a house where the heat does not go out through the window. That's what we want. And also that the heat should be provided by a heat pump. In energy terms, a heat pump is four or five times more efficient uh, than a gas boiler, four or five times more efficient. Those heat pumps have to be uh, distributed. The engineers have to learn how to use them. And this will reduce the amount of gas that Ukraine needs very, very substantially. May, let me make one final point, Alexander, which is to respond to your point that you made earlier. You said I made four demands. Actually, let's clarify. Um, I understand that each of the four things I talked about, for example, getting energy from renewables, I mean, that's not a demand. I'm, I'm not demanding that from anybody because no one person can, can do that. That's an approach, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a way of looking at the problem. And I understand that these problems are very, very uh, complicated. And so I'm, I don't want to say I'm not demanding that, I am not demanding that Ukraine does not build Khmelnytsky three and four, but I am asking the labor movement in Ukraine, already we have an energy minister, Kalushenko, who loves nuclear, we have a powerful nuclear lobby that loves nuclear. Okay, let those guys demand. We should demand energy efficient homes. We should demand renewables. We should demand energy as a right, as a service, not as a commodity. These are things that, as you, as you said, Alexander, the labor movement now in Ukraine is not strong. 
Mm. But it can start to demand these things. And of course, we try in the labor movement, those of us in the labor movement in Europe, we will also shout about these things as loud as we can and shout against stupid schemes to export hydrogen. Дякую вам. Я думаю, це дуже важливо в Україні, принаймні на такому медійному рівні. Окей, я думаю, це дуже важливо, навіть на медіа рівні, щоб змінити відповідальний дискурс. І це дуже вдягнуваємо. Це робить нас працювати важче. Це те, що мотивує нас, щоб мати дискусії, щоб публікувати артикли, тому що ми були for a long time in Ukraine under some kind of copying foreign practices. We were under this uh, impact of old neoliberal approach, like we will allow everybody to build whatever they want and people will build renewable electric stations in Ukraine, they will get cheap electricity. No, it's not that simple. Uh, uh, some political decisions should be taken. And Marina has told us that various shift to renewables might take place. For example, we might export not just some grain, but uh, uh, clean energy. And still, we may not decarbonize us completely. So it'll be promoting our own vision, and I'll hope it will change our energy policy. So, Mr. Leszek, I have a question to you. So, my question is as follows. In continuation with the previous concept, let's imagine that some point of view will lead and will be building new very safe nuclear power stations but supply and control of uh, construction and power import from ukraine power export from ukraine it will not go to ukrainian society so ukrainians will not profit from them won't it be a new type of neo-colonial dependency uh, so one more question just recently it was kind of a kind of a on the table question an urgent question uh, what about used nuclear fuel uh, because you need to store it somewhere and can it happen that way that everybody will uh, transport it to ukraine and so ukraine will be a trash place for old like and for nuclear fuel storage so these are my two questions and one more question what about uh, the way nuclear power stations can be prolonged that is many nuclear power stations are outdated and many people say they should be closed right now but uh, we can hear that uh, the time of functioning might be prolonged. What does uh, international science say about this? So three questions to you, Mr. Leszek, please. The floor is yours. OK, thank you. So first, um, I think that what Ukraine needs and generally Europe needs are strong labor movement in the energy sector to ensure that no neo-colonial extraction takes place. <laughs> and as a rule, if you have highly qualified and difficult to replace workers who are coming to a single place like a nuclear power plant, it's easier to unionize them than when you have solar panel installers, which is a simple job and easier to replace a single worker working all over the country and not meeting in one place. And we also need uh, EU wide labor movement solidarity, uh, probably also expressed uh, mm -hmm. during the process of Ukraine joining the European Union, because right now your newest law makes it very easy to fire workers and it's generally anti-labor and this law will have to be rescinded after the war ends. Just uh, the EU has to require that, sorry, you, you just passed this extremely neoliberal law 
it was for a war, okay, but now the war is over and you need European labor standards. This is extremely important. As for nuclear fuel, there are uh, IAEA, uh, International uh, Atomic Energy Agency regulations on transporting spent nuclear fuel and so on. And the IAEA are the guys who went to the Zaporozhia plant to check what the Russians are doing there. So they're pretty devoted to their job, I'd say. And uh, basically it makes no sense to transport nuclear fuel, spent nuclear fuel to, to Ukraine because spent nuclear fuel can be reprocessed, but the reprocessing is done in since it has an increased risk of generating nuclear material that could be used in weapons. It is done in countries that already have nuclear weapons because they have procedures to control it. So they have, like France, for example, reprocesses nuclear fuel. Uh, and also I would like to, uh, Again, uh, to, 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 to just uh, refer to uh, what Christian was saying earlier, that I, I agree in 100% that we need a degrowth, but we need to do, again, Ukraine is not capable of introducing degrowth on its own. It's a really, in effect, colonialized country. I, I really recommend in, to anybody who has not read it, Less is More by Jason Pickel, which uh, really nicely explains the principle of degrowth. And it explains that rich countries have to decrease their consumption while countries that were victims of colonialism have to develop. Development is not growth, but they have to build their uh, industries like low carbon energy, energy efficient housing, public transit, and so on. And we have to keep in mind, it is like not commonly thought about it this way, but Ukraine was a victim of colonialism of Russia. She, Ukraine was drained of resources by Russia. Uh, so it's not really that Ukraine was a developed country that build stuff for its own purpose. They built stuff for the USSR and then this stuff traveled to, 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 to other places. And one more thing that I would like to point out that there are really, it was in reference to Simon's uh, presentation, that there are no inherently socialistic or inherently democratic technologies because I do a lot of translations for the energy sector and I translated things related to wind power. I translated things related to solar power, to coal, to gas, to energy storage and to energy transmissions. And the customer were all the same international corporations. So we really need to control these corporations and to change our system. But before we change our system, we still need to build the stuff that we need to transform the system, like Marina said low carbon energy, energy efficient housing, public trend. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Jelisek. It's really very important what he said at the end. Um, it's something that's very important for Ukraine um, to understand the technological solutions on their own cannot change the uh, condition, the living conditions of people. Um, those technological solutions have to have underlying political will, political decisions in order to guide the technological solutions um, into the um, right direction in order to help people. So yes, um, let's hope that movements championing such causes will appear in Ukraine and that Ukrainian resistance will mean that people also um, vocally um, are ready to defend their rights and interests in peace time. And I think we have some questions on Zoom from our attendees. So let's give people the opportunity to, answer, to ask those questions but I would like to remind everyone to skip to the time limit because we are quick, quickly approaching our uh, end of discussion. So Rachel, if you'd like to ask, please turn your mic on and ask the question. Uh, can you hear me? Um, okay, uh, goodness. Am I, can you, oh, can you hear me? Uh, Oh no. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Sorry. Sorry. I forgot. Uh, just about uh, 
kind of, I mean, as everyone seems to know so much about this war and above that has been about Russia's dominant energy dominance mm -hmm. in Europe and the world. And as that uh, is going away for, you know, political and ecological and so many other necessary reasons, I think they are not going to take it too well. They're, we're already seeing very some strong mask off moments and thinking about what we can possibly uh, expect in terms of on um, communication and oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I get very annoyed by people who cynically worry about the um, nuclear button saber rattling, which is very more often than not true cynicism of people who had uh, that kind of ulterior motives, but just about what we can possibly expect to um, what, you know, but what we can, yeah, it, see from from Russia in terms of what it will say and what it will do as it leaves the realm of being a behemoth of, uh, you know, of the energy sector on a global scale. Thank you, Rachel. Maybe one of our panelists would like to try and answer that question. So Russia's actions reflected on local level, what can be done about this situation? Simon, the floor is yours. Well, I, I, I cannot answer all the issues you have mentioned, but I think one thing that's very important to notice and to think about is that uh, Russia has an oil export uh, business, which it relies on. It is trying very hard to maintain its oil output while the sanctions uh, take effect. These sanctions are not very um, efficient. Uh, the Western countries uh, do not want to stop uh, Russia from exporting oil. They want to make it look as though they are doing something while the oil now goes mostly to Asia. In the case of gas, I think something different is happening and very interesting, which is that uh, the gas business built up mainly between Russia and Germany over 40 years is now being destroyed by, by the Kremlin. The Kremlin is telling Gazprom to reduce the level of gas export to Europe. Christian showed us some graphs about this. They are destroying their own business. Economically, this is crazy. What it shows is that in Russian policy, it has become more important to wage this war against Ukraine. It has become more important to promote militarism and imperialism, more important than to make money from the gas business to Europe, which was a big thing for Russia during the whole post-Soviet period. And I think this is something to think about. This is a, a stage in the degeneration of the Russian empire. Thank you. Um, so a technical moment we are gathering questions collecting questions from our listeners and then um, we have a question to Leszek from Fabian um, when you talk about the independence of people who have um, nuclear weapons is that um, the case is nuclear really solution to be independent of energy supplies from Russia, and it, especially as Rosatom is one of the biggest global players when it comes to nuclear power. And I can answer that um, Ukraine shifted to other resources, but still we have some kind of dependency here. And maybe um, this is a kind of um, distorted view on the situation in Russia will have still um, the nuclear um, sector and then the Rosatom is becoming one of the most dominant players in the world. So Leszek, what do you think about this? A minute or two, perhaps. 
Okay, so when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, because that's when the war started, Ukraine started the process of switching its nuclear power su fuel supplies from Rosatom to Westinghouse. And this process is now finished. So now new Ukrainian atomic fuel will come from the US. Russia's nuclear fuel exports are responsible for a very, very small fraction of Russian income, unlike fossil fuel exports, because a single nuclear power plant uses one train car of fuel per year, and a single coal plant uses one train of fuel per day. So it's an enormous difference. And uh, Russian uh, VVER-1000 nuclear reactors are a very modern and effective technology, but they are now operated by Ukrainian operators and by a Ukrainian company, Nerhoatom. And uh, if Ukraine builds new power plants, they will be American AP-1000 Westinghouse plants. Generally, with nuclear power plants, if you have a power plant on your uh, territory, you can get supplies from uh, fuel supplies from many countries. You can get them from France, you can get them from the US. Uh, but and you can get that from Russia if you want, but obviously we don't want it. Uh, and in case of a gas power plant, you're much more dependent on the supplies of fuel. So uh, nuclear provides more energy security because it's easier to stockpile a few years worth of fuel. Thank you. Just the end. And then, if you remark from Marina, I'm guessing I'd like to very briefly address the question about nuclear energy and about the dependency um, on Russia in this question. I'd like to point out that before 2021, Ukraine um, paid Russia for the storage of nuclear waste, even after the start of the war in Donbass, and paid uh, quite big sums of money for this. Um, this has been only stopped recently. And there is this centralized storage at, on the premises of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant where the nuclear waste is taken. But this shift only occurred recently, so we need to bear that in mind. It's not something that is well known, that is on the surface, but this is still a relevant issue. And then I'd like to point out that in all the debates about nuclear energy, I'd like to point out that the whole process of design and construction of nuclear power plants takes a lot of time, decades basically, and this is a problem uh, when we look especially at the, the Ukrainian situation at the fact that the infrastructure is suffering, this is the scenario which is not really going to work. There are many examples, Finland to China, of nuclear power plants being built. Um, so from planning to operation, perhaps 10 years, perhaps 15 years, Pass. So 10, 15 years between the moment when the power plant is designed and starts operating. So in the case of um, Hamelnitsk power plant, we had the same situation. The planning started um, still in the Soviet Union. And then right now, uh, we are still talking about um, people working on the designs for the power plant's operation. So this is the um, general situation, and then there is Ukrainian situation, this particular current situation we are in. I would say that nuclear energy is not really very reliable in this context. Marina, thank you. And I know we have some questions in Zoom. I'd like to apologize to those people who are submitting their questions right now. Unfortunately, we have a time limit here, so I would like to um, ask our participants this last generalizing question. What do you think about um, these steps, the measures that Ukraine could take one by one? Um, which questions would you suggest for Ukrainian actors in this situation, Ukrainian government, social movements perhaps, and what can be done globally 
by international players in order to lessen the energy dependencies, what needs to be changed in Ukraine and what needs to be changed on the international level in order to achieve the priorities you were talking about. So a minute or two for your responses. In which order would you like to go? It is up to you. Then I start. So as for the first question, I agree with the thoughts by Christian and Simon. As for development of social infrastructure in Ukraine, especially in the afterward recovery, and not to consider the social economic infrastructure as a separate thing from the green recovery, because quite often these two notions are being juxtaposed. They are the same thing. That's the first thing I want to say, and then in the Ukrainian context, following the Ukrainian regulations, which are different from the European regulations, we need to focus on transparency of the regulation authority, because everything that is controlled by the government isn't quite often working for the sake of population, for the benefit of population. There are lots of various schemes that are being implemented in the Ukrainian energy sector. Quite often, those were implemented first with the neoliberalized energy market, and some Ukrainian energy companies got special purpose role, so they actually delivered cheap electricity to the household, while private detect company of oligarch Ahmeto sold electricity at higher price. That's why we need transparency for the regulator for the benefit of general population. Then we need to engage representatives of local communities and NGOs not just the government should develop a master plan of recovery because local communities know better what was the damage and what infrastructure needs to be recovered first and foremost these are the primary solutions like local plans for recovery at the community or regional level not just one master plan by the government as of international level, then we should speak. We need the support by the progressive forces, those that would underline the state of Ukraine, those that would engage in discussions as of green transition, energy transition and socio-economic transition has been very important for Ukraine in its recovery. This is actual necessity also in the context of European integration. Not only climatic environmental obligations, not only decrease of carbon emissions, but also implementation of proper labor legislation and treatment of it has been something important. Sorry, Marina, just to answer one question because we don't have much time. So somebody else who wants to speak. So Simon, floor is yours. Thank you. Very, very quickly, Marina has already said a lot I agree with her that we must challenge the whole idea of electricity being provided through these market, uh, the, these, this market framework. And as I said before, I think let's take up the labor movement demand, very old demand for electricity and energy as a right. I think about workers, uh, Lesek mentioned this before. I think we should support organization both 
by highly skilled nuclear workers and also by workers who are installing solar panels or mending gas pipelines that have been bombed by Putin or whatever. All these workers <coughs> deserve our support and, and should be invited into our conversations about the future of the energy system. I think a third point, very important, is the transition away from coal and this discussion in Donbass. I think this is a very uh, hopeful moment in this terrible uh, days that Donbass is going through, that people are now thinking about the future without coal. This is, to me, very heartening. Uh, and also, let us hear, let's continue our conversation with email, with uh, whatever uh, between ourselves to work out socialist answers to all these difficult problems. Okay, uh, thank so, you, Leszek. Uh, I fully agree that electricity should be decommodified because uh, the long time obsession of the European Commission with uh, ener markets everywhere and energy markets is one of the things that have led to this energy crisis. In the same manner, uh, trade emissions trading schemes are also an, an, a problem. I mean, we should replace EPS, which is an emission trading scheme which lends itself to speculation with a simple carbon tax that increases with time. And we should demand more labor union power and labor unions should cooperate uh, within the whole Europe. So during the EU accession, uh, EU accession process of Ukraine. And these labor unions should demand green transition. Uh, and I really think that stricter integration of Ukraine with EU wide energy grid would be helpful here uh, if we increase the amount of, of renewables in the grid because it works both ways. Both Ukraine can help Europe when it has high renewables generation and Europe doesn't, and the other way around, when Europe has a lot of renewables generation and Ukraine does it, then energy flows can flow from EU to, to from the rest of Europe to Ukraine. And uh, at the end, I would like also to mention that energy workers of Ukraine working under the current conditions of war are very important heroes for, for uh, current Ukraine state and Heroyan Slava. Thank you. Christian? Mm, uh, uh, Christian, would you like to comment briefly? Uh, very shortly. I 100% agree with Simon on this whole issue of social infrastructure in a broad sense of the word. Uh, Leszek uh, also mentioned this. <clears throat> I think the, this could be even a unified perspective and where we can combine different scales of action on a very local level, even in the boroughs of, of cities, we can combine it with the national scale and even with the, with the transnational scale, All, always with the same the same approach so as and we have to think about how we can uh, develop it creatively and together uh, i do not agree with lessec on the nuclear power issue i think uh, i think one comrade in the in the q and a already mentioned that even if the natural conditions change, we saw it to this year in France. France was not able to cool <laughs> its power stations. They had to switch off 50% of the entire nuclear power stations. So we had we came to a very paradoxical situation that Germany now delivered electricity to France coming from renewables and bought French gas coming from I don't know where. <laughs> so, so it's very it's a, a strange situation. What we have to think more about is how, how we can combine our perspective, how we can upscale our perspectives, even on a short term uh, uh, frame. So how we can combine this entire question of social appropriation, of socialization, even on a European scale. That I do not have an answer, but we, we, can, we come to this question on transportation, uh, on energy, on lots of things. Is there, 
perspective, can we raise the question of some kind of public ownership on a European scale? It's not only local or the national, it can be upscaled, but that's an open question. Uh, more. You have to think about it. Thank you, everyone, for this exciting discussion. Um, so several times people talked today about nuclear energy. Yesterday, actually, when we discussed the labor rights during one of the events of our conference, we talked about um, the example of the labor trade union of people working in the nuclear sector, where actually there are um, many activists and they have had many successes uh, in protecting labor rights in the um, nuclear sector energy even during the war. And then thank you everyone for starting this discussion today. I uh, hope that we um, will be um, able to spread the word and to continue this discussion by publications and other meetings and I hope that um, we will be able short term to come to the understanding of which alternatives we put uh, put forward. And in an hour, we are starting a discussion on um, housing and accommodation and the reconstruction of um, damaged or ruined buildings in Ukraine. And then tomorrow, during the last day of our conference, we'll focus more on um, military questions, on the participation of Ukrainian left act activists in the war and how we could change the global security system in order for it not to depend on um, the factors that um, define it today. So thank you, everyone, and we hope we'll continue this discussion later.